Hello, I'm Jo Fidgen, and this is Outlook, the programme that takes you around the world through incredible personal stories. In March this year, a video was released which shocked the world. It had been made by a daughter of the ruler of Dubai, Princess Latifa, who was planning to flee the country without her father's permission. Pretty soon, I'm going to be leaving somehow. And I'm not so sure of the outcome, but... I'm 99% positive it will work. And if you are watching this video, it's not such a good thing. Either I'm dead or I'm in a very, very, very bad situation. A few days before the video came out, Latifa had indeed been caught while trying to get away. She hasn't been seen since. By her side throughout the escape attempt was her best friend, Tina Jauhjanen, who'd moved to Dubai from Finland. Tina was a fan of capoeira, the Brazilian martial art, and was working at a capoeira club when she received a mysterious request for private lessons. She was looking for a female instructor, and even though I explained to her that I wasn't a qualified instructor, she said, I'm sure your level is good enough to come and come and teach me. Did she tell you who she first? She just described her as an Arab female. She didn't tell me who she was. So it was only when I went to the family horse racing stables to meet up with her, I realized that she must be part of the Dubai ruling family. What were these stables like? They are enormous, and when you look at it, it's kind of in the center of the city. So you see all the the Dubai skyline around it. They're beautiful stables with obviously very expensive horses, a lot of stuff from all over the world. So you twigged that Latifa, this mysterious Arab woman who'd contacted you, must be connected to royalty. At what point did she say to you, yes, I'm I'm a princess? Well, she never used the word princess to start with, and she didn't tell me exactly, you know, whose daughter she was. It was only maybe after two, three sessions that we had trained, did I ask her, you know, if if her father was who I thought he was. Initially, I felt a bit nervous. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a bit underqualified. <laughs> like, why didn't she find someone else or even bring a person from Brazil to teach her? I felt quite privileged in many ways that she had picked me to teach her. How did you get along? We got along really well from the beginning. Initially, she came across as quite a shy and introverted person, but we got to know each other better and we we became friends. How strong was that friendship over time? Towards the end, obviously, we're, we're the best of friends and Latifa used to describe me as the family she chose. How did so, that make you feel? Very good. I mean, I know she was not close to any of her family members and... After some time when she had told me about about her family life and, and everything that had happened to her in the past, I understood that she didn't have anyone in her family she felt close to and, and nobody she could really trust. What did she say to you about her family? Well, she told me about her childhood, how she grew up in the palace. She was taken away from her mother when she was just a baby and she was kind of brought up by her auntie and a Filipino maid. So she only moved to her mother's house when she was around 12 years old. So she never felt the kind of connection to her actual real mother, really. How much time would you spend together as time went by? She would invite me for different type of gatherings with some of her, um, you know, close group of friends. And um, after some time, I basically gained their trust, I believe. So I was treated like one of the official chaperones. So I was able to meet Latifa, for instance, in the shopping malls. When the driver would see me waiting, he would be able to drop her off and we could be doing whatever we wanted to. And you went skydiving together? Yeah, we started skydiving um, end of 2013. I think it's somehow changed Latifa to become more... uh, sociable and open with people. How many years into your relationship was it that she said to you that she had been thinking of escaping? It wasn't until 2016. First she started off by telling me about her sister Shamsa and her um, escape in the UK in 2000, how she got caught and, and she was kidnapped and brought back to UAE. She told me that as a result of that, she spent eight years in in prison. 
And in 2002, Latifa tried to escape for the first time. She basically wanted to get help for Shamsa and she thought even if she would get caught, at least finally she would end up being with her sister. They would put her in the same prison with her and at the end it wouldn't be so bad because they would be together. She told me about her own um, prison experience, how she was tortured. I actually started crying because I was shocked. I asked her, you know, I have known you for so many years. Why didn't you tell me before? Like, I would have understood. I often saw her depressed and feeling anxious and, and sad, but she just couldn't open up to me before. She felt like she couldn't tell anyone. It was only in 2017 she actually asked me to, to help her to escape. What did you say? I said yes, of course. Immediately? Immediately, yes. I always felt so sad and I felt like, you know, her life was passing her by, like without her being able to live a normal life. So when she said that she wants to leave and she asked for my help, I felt happy that she trusted me and I felt happy that I would be the person to live with her. Did you think about the risks? I only um, understood the risks after having met with uh, Hervé Jobert. This is the French man who was going to help her get to India initially. That was the plan. Exactly. So Latifa asked me to travel to the Philippines to meet up with Hervé to discuss the different options for the escape and do the planning, basically. Why had she asked Hervé to get involved? Latifa had read a book written by Hervé himself. He had escaped from Dubai about 10 years prior himself. They had been emailing each other for about seven years, which obviously I had no idea of. So she told me that I know this man who has been ready to help me to escape for so many years. And now with your help, I finally feel confident that it's, it's the right time to do it. And so she asked you to go and meet him in the Philippines. Exactly. Which you did several times. I went to the Philippines about four times. That's when I understood the risks, because he told me about his own escape and, and he told me that afterwards, you know, we might have to be hiding in the US where Latifa wanted to seek asylum. He said that it wouldn't be easy. They would come after all of us. But she was convinced that this was the thing to do. She was convinced. I think the turning point was that we lost a very close friend in a skydiving accident in the end of May 2017. And that's when Latifa thought, life is, life is actually very short. She wanted to take the risk. She said, this is life or death for me. So come the day of the escape, maybe the day before, how were you feeling at that point? I was extremely nervous. I couldn't sleep. I was thinking, what if this goes wrong, you know? But somehow I felt like we had planned it very, very well. Latifa had made a video before she went, just in case things went wrong, which was to be released in those circumstances. Had you seen that video before you left? Well, I was basically there when the video was made. It was made in uh, my apartment. Hello, my name is Latifa Al Maktoum. I was born on December 5, 1985. Um, my father is the Prime Minister of UAE and uh, the ruler of Dubai, Mohammed bin Rashid Said Al Maktoum. And I'm making this video because it could be the last video I make. We actually sent the video to some of our close friends outside UAE and I instructed one of my friends that in case, you know, we would go missing, please get it released. So I'm not allowed to drive. I'm not allowed to travel or leave Dubai at all. I can't. I haven't left the country since 2000. Uh, I've been asking a lot to just to go traveling, to study, to, to do anything normal. They, they don't let me. I have a curfew when I go out and I come back home. I have to be back at a certain time. Yeah, so that's my life basically. It's very restricted. And Latifa wanted the world to know the truth about Dubai. Because most people see Dubai as a holiday destination, you know, five-star hotels, luxury lifestyle, but they don't know the truth behind it all, you know. It's a place with poor uh, human rights record. She wanted people to know that. And also she thought that maybe her story would help some other women in the same position as she is. Women specifically? Exactly. Yeah, Latifa's plan was actually to work in women's rights after uh, claiming her asylum in the US. 
she wanted to help women who are oppressed and and treated like like she was. So then the morning comes around. What was your plan, the two of you? The plan was to meet up very early in the morning for breakfast. We had done that several times in the past, so the Latifah's driver wouldn't think that it was unusual for us to meet already at 6.30 in the morning. So the plan was to meet up, drive to Oman, board a dinghy outside Muscat, and go to international waters where Hervé and his crew members were waiting in uh, his yacht. And the plan was to sail to India, from there to fly to US and claim political asylum over there. And initially things went to plan? Initially things went to plan, yes. We spent eight days at sea. We realized that we were being followed. We saw a search and rescue plane above us. And also Hervé had seen a boat six to eight miles behind us. We were obviously nervous. Definitely Latifa was. She said, I know what my father is capable of. She was getting increasingly worried. How would you pass the time? We were mostly just, just talking. We're trying to feel a bit more calm by talking about the things we wanted to do in the future. But it was hard. We were both quite nervous, actually. Tell us then what happened when armed people approached the boat. Myself and Latifa, we were um, down in the cabin. I remember just having brushed my teeth when we started hearing these really loud noises from the upper deck. It also sounded like there were some gunshots. We got really scared. We were hugging each other. And Latifa said, ah, oh, you know, they come after me. They're here. We locked ourselves to the bathroom. And soon after, it started filling with smoke. And we couldn't breathe, so we actually had to come out. There was only one set of stairs leading to the upper deck. So, you know, holding hands, we were approaching the stairs. And then uh, on top of the stairs, we were met by like a group of uh, like some sort of special forces wearing black outfits. Um, there were several machine guns pointing at us with laser sights. Someone pushed me to the floor and I realized I was in a pond of blood. I was I was I was terrified. I thought maybe, you know, the captain of the boat, Ray or one of the crew members have already been killed. I remember my heart just pounding really fast and thinking, oh my God, what's what's happening to us? They basically tied my hands behind my back and I was told not to move or they would shoot me. Did you expect to die at that moment? Yes, I thought I'm, I'm not going to survive. Two of these um, men, they basically dragged me to the uh, outer deck and they were pushing me towards the railing and pushing my head towards the sea. And they told me to um, take my last breath and and they were threatening to shoot my brain out. At that point, I remember thinking, yeah, this is it. You know, when you see your life passing in front of your eyes, I was thinking about my family. I was thinking about, <laughs> will I first drown or will it be the bullets that will eventually kill me? The situation was very, very scary and unreal at the same time. And what happened? These men then um, dragged me to the front deck and they pushed me to the floor. I saw uh, Latifa lying there on the floor. Her um, hands were tied behind her back as well. And she kept on screaming. And these men told me to, to close my eyes again and they were threatening to shoot me. And Latifa was defending me. She said, leave my friend alone. And they said, oh, be quiet or we shoot you. Latifa continued uh, repeating that she's seeking for political asylum. And obviously these men were not, not listening to her. Soon after, I, I heard someone speaking Arabic and I realized that someone had come to identify her and take her away. Latifa was kicking and screaming. She was saying, don't take me back to UA, rather shoot me here. And what did happen to her? What did you see? Um, I saw her being tracked off the boat. She was probably taken away with the, with the helicopter. Was she still shouting, screaming? She was, yeah. At what point did you realise that you weren't going to be killed? The same person who um, took Latifa away um, came, came back to the boat. 
he told me that if you want to jump off the boat now, you can. Uh, he was basically suggesting that it would be easier for me to, to kill myself because what was waiting for me in the UAE was not going to be pleasant. Did you consider it? Um, no, no. At that point, I, I, I think I was in a kind of a shock. I, I wasn't thinking straight. I, I couldn't stop thinking about what happened to what had happened to Latifa. I was actually more worried about her condition than what was going to happen to me at that point. What was waiting for you in the UAE? Upon arrival, we were blindfolded and handcuffed. I had to sign some uh, papers in Arabic. Did you know what they said, those papers? N no. I was immediately taken to a small room for interrogation that I think initially went on for at least 20 hours. In one go? In one go. Did you have any sense of what the plans were for you, of what your future was meant to be? Well, I was, I was threatened with a death penalty initially. They said, what you have done is stabbing the, the ruler of Dubai in the back. Like, this is one of the worst things you could have done by helping his, his daughter escape. Obviously, at that point, I was terrified. I thought, you know, how, how could I possibly contact my family? I was thinking they must be so worried, not knowing where I am. I didn't know how many days had passed since the attack at sea. I had no idea what day it was, what time it was. It was very scary. But while you were in there, the video that Latifa had made was released. So I need to make this video in case I don't make it. It's not gonna be in vain. Uh, somebody will have some footage. I have to. I have to remember to say everything, because this could be the last video I made. I don't know what, what else to say. Uh, I don't know what else to say. It caused a huge uproar when it when it came out. Did you Did you know that that video was now out there and being seen? I was captured in in UAE for about two weeks. And I remember at one point, everything changed. I was told that, you know, if I record um, a video confession, obviously they were telling me what to say. And uh, I had to sign a confession in Arabic and um, also sign another uh, non-disclosure agreement, which was in English, saying that I will never speak to anyone about what happened to me, including my family. They said, you should consider yourself very lucky. He's going to let you go. And I thought, that's very strange, because just a couple of days ago, I thought I would never be let out. It was only after when I looked at the timeline of events, I understood that it was because it had become such big news. How was it to be back in Helsinki with with family, with friends after that? It all felt unreal to me. I was like, what had just happened? My um, family had feared that I was dead for about three weeks. So it had been very, very hard for them. And it was only when I saw them, I realized that this whole event had caused so much grief to my family. Thank you to all my friends and to the people who really care about me and to, my, to the family members who do care about me. You know who you are. Uh, thank you to those people. And uh, if I don't make it out, I really hope that some positive change will happen from all of this. Have you got any idea what's happened to Latifa? She hasn't been seen since. Uh, no. The Dubai government actually issued a public statement saying that both Latifa and Shamsa are with the family and uh, they're happy, which I find incredible. After uh, her being uh, missing for nine months, they were actually claiming that she was happy and celebrating her birthday with her family. If she was, she would definitely be contacting me. I think that the truth is more like she is somewhere locked up and, and not allowed any contact with the outside world. Can you do anything for her? I mean, obviously you've broken the non-disclosure agreement. You are talking about the situation I wonder if you're afraid sometimes by, you know, that, you've, that you've done that. It was only when I was first released 
that I was suffering from PTSD and I couldn't sleep. I feel like the more I talk about the events and what happened, I, I feel safer. And I also feel better because it, it was really Latifa's plan. She said, even in the video, that in case, you know, she didn't make it, she was hoping that there would be some positive change coming out of this. So I feel like more people are knowing about her, her plight, her situation and how women are really treated in, in the UAE. So it's, it's almost like at the end, one of her dreams have already come true. What have you been doing in the months since then? Are you are you back on your feet? Are you working? What's your situation? I haven't made a decision yet on what I'm going to be doing myself. I've been quite busy campaigning for her freedom. And I also think that instead of going back to, to sales or tourism industry, I might actually follow a path that involves more humanitarian work. So you're, you've been changed or your perspective has been changed? Exactly. This, this has changed all my life, really. How often do you think of her and her situation? There's not a single day that goes by that I, I wouldn't be thinking about her. If there were any possibility that Latifa could hear this broadcast, what would you say to her? Well, I would, I would want her to know that I love her very much. And I would like to send her support and 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 positive vibes to 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 carry on, you know, fighting and not not giving up. I'm not going to give up on her. I will I will fight for her rights. I'm feeling positive about the future. I'm feeling like um, it's the start of an adventure. It's the start of of me claiming my life, my freedom, freedom of choice. I don't expect it to be easy, nothing's easy, but I expect it to be the start of a new chapter in my life and one where I have some voice where I don't have to be silenced. I'm really looking forward to that. Tina Yaushanan and the BBC have made a documentary called Escape from Dubai, The Mystery of the Missing Princess. This is part of the statement that has been released by the Dubai Rulers Court. We are aware and deeply saddened by the continued media speculation regarding Her Highness Sheikha Latifa bint Mohammed Maktoum. This private family matter has caused significant upset and distress for all concerned, most of all Sheikha Latifa. Sheikha Latifa and Sheikha Shamsa are adored and cherished by their family. More from Outlook coming your way tomorrow.